All right, so now we're starting Newton's laws. So Newton's three laws here. Uh, the first law, an object in motion will remain in motion, and an object at rest will remain at rest unless it's acted upon by an outside force. Now, the first, uh, I should say the second half, should make a lot of sense to you because if, you know, I have a table and something is sitting on the table, that object is going to just sit there on the table, not moving, until you come and apply some force to it, until you push it, right? And whenever you push it, the thing will fly off. The second, or the, the first part, an object in motion will remain in motion um, unless acted upon by an outside force might not make complete sense to you. And, and another thought for this um, will remain in motion in a straight line. Okay, in, in a straight line. It's not even going to turn. It's going to keep on going straight the entire time. And we don't really see that on Earth because whenever you're here on Earth, and let's kind of get a big picture idea going on here. So here I have Earth, right? Whenever an object is thrown here on Earth, what happens? Well, it, it, it hits the surface, right? It comes back down. Why is that? Well, it's because whenever an object is thrown, and now um, let's just throw an object that way, there is a force acting on it at all times. The force of gravity, right? Gravity is pulling it downwards. On the other hand, if we got rid of gravity, if we completely erased gravity off, so aka we have to actually erase the Earth, what you're going to end up finding is the object that's going in motion will continue to go at the same speed at a constant velocity without curving or moving at all um, the entire time until some force is applied to it. And by the way, gravity, it's kind of everywhere, right? Even in outer space, um, you gotta be, you're going to still be influenced by gravity. You have to be in the far depths or reaches uh, between our galaxies to actually escape uh, the force of gravity. Number two is actually the one we will be using the most here because it lets us do some math. An object will accelerate at a rate directly proportional to the net force applied to it and inversely proportional to its mass. What that means in mathematical terms is F equals MA, but more specifically, sigma or sum of the forces equals MA. Okay, and let's actually make this a little flatter there. Sigma F, or sum of the forces, equals MA. Okay, so if you add up all the forces on it, that's going to equal to whatever the mass times the object's acceleration is going to be. The third law, for every force on an object, there will be an equal and opposite force exerted by that object. This is my favorite uh, law as a parent. It was probably your, uh, it probably still is your parent's favorite law, right? Because it goes something like this. For every action you do, young lady or young man, there will be an equal and opposite reaction, right? And that's generally whenever you're sent to your room or whatever else is going to end up coming down, comes down because you, you did something that wasn't good. Um, so for every, for every force on an object, there will be an equal and opposite force exerted by that object. So a couple of examples here for you. Let's start with the rocket on the right. The rocket has a bunch of gas inside of it in liquid form, rocket fuel, if you will. And whenever you ignite it, all of this, what was liquid, becomes a gas really hot and spews out the back. So the rocket is actually pushing gas out the back, applying a force to the gas and shoving it out the rear end. Well, likewise... Now the gas is being shoved downwards, so the gas is going to apply an equal and opposite force on the rocket, making it go upwards, right? Force on the rocket here. Let's talk about driving. Whenever you drive, right, your tires, assuming you're not in snowy conditions like we have going on here, which I'll talk about, um, whenever you drive, your tires grip the road. And so you uh, are actually applying a force on the earth. You're actually trying to push the road backwards. Well, the earth's kind of big, and technically you are pushing the earth backwards a little bit, but it's so big you don't ever really notice. Um, so you apply a force on the road trying to push it backwards. Well, what's the road going to do? It's going to apply the exact same force that you applied on it to you, uh, making you go forward. So you apply a force to try to push the road backwards, so the road applies the same force to you, making you go 
forwards. This is why if you're actually in a snowy condition, right, you try to apply a force to the road going backwards and you can't get any grip. Well, if, if you can't get any grip going on here, then um, you're not actually going to get any force being applied. If you can't get any force where you're trying to push the road backwards, well, you're not going to get pushed forwards by the road either. Allow me to double back into the first law here. The first law is also called the law of inertia, right? Inertia basically is uh, how is the property of an object that resists the change in motion. It is the first law. It's the property that means that if an object is at rest, it wants to stay at rest. And if the object is in motion, it wants to stay in motion. The greater the inertia, the more it resists any outside force trying to change it. Think of a semi-truck. Really, really large, right? One of the big 18-wheelers. So if, if the 18-wheeler is in motion, going down the road, going down the interstate at 65 miles per hour, it resists being slowed down. It requires a lot of force to slow down that 18-wheeler because of its such large mass, right? Likewise, if it's at rest, it, it has a, this guy has a lot of inertia, you don't just go behind a big 18-wheeler and give it a push and get it going. It has a large inertia because it has such a large mass. On the other hand, something very small, whether it's your pencil in your hand, it has a low inertia, a small amount of mass. A outside force can come along and take it from rest and accelerate it into motion very easily. And if it's in motion, you can stop it very quickly due to its low inertia. All right, so let's solve a problem with Newton's second law and, and look at our equation a little bit more in depth at the exact same time. So sum of the forces equals ma. Now this, this sigma, this is Greek letter sigma, it just means sum of. So what force 1 plus force 2 plus force 3 is. Forces, F, are measured in units of newtons. Okay. Uh, your mass, you already know, units of kilograms, and you know about acceleration. Acceleration is units of meters per second squared. So here I have a problem. A car's engine is capable of, is capable of exerting 4,000 newtons of force to cause the car to accelerate forward. If the car has a mass of 800 kilograms, what is the car's theore theoretical maximum acceleration? Well, so some of the forces here equals ma. I only have one force, so that I'm not I'm not adding up any extras. That just goes right in for force here. Four thousand equals my mass, eight hundred times a. Now all I need to do now is divide both sides by eight hundred, and I come out with an acceleration of five. And check out number of sig figs. Looks like I got three here is the smallest. So five point oh oh meters per second squared. All right, so now this concept of mass versus weight. Now, we talk about weight all the time. How much do you weigh? How much does this car weigh, right? And we don't talk about mass unless you're in a science class. Now, mass is the quantity of matter that makes up an object. In other words, how much stuff is actually in that object, where weight is the force of gravity on an object. So we can actually get away with talking about weight in our normal terminology because the force of gravity or, or the acceleration of gravity doesn't change. So specifically, remember sum of the forces equals ma. And, and here we're only dealing with the force of gravity. So the force of gravity, some, you'll see some textbooks just use a W there for Fg, is going to be mass times the acceleration of gravity. Let me use a G for that, where, where this is... 9.81 meters per second squared, right? That's what g is, the acceleration of gravity. So really for us, the only thing that changes our weight or our force of gravity is going to be the mass, because we're never changing the gravity here on Earth. You actually have to get a long ways away from the Earth's surface or travel to a different planet to change the acceleration of gravity. So, I mean, just simply put, if I asked, well, what is the weight of a... 50 kilogram person, well now I'm solving for the force of gravity, right? And mass, 50 kilograms, gravity, 9.81. Here I'm just going to estimate this just for the sake of time here to be 10 
So my weight would come out to be approximately 500 newtons. Ch check out the units because uh, weight is a force, right? So unit of newtons here. All right, so these Newton's second law problems can also tie into all the other types of problems we've done. So here is one that's going to tie into one-dimensional kinematics. So I have a 250-gram bullet shot out of a rifle with a barrel length of 79 centimeters. Alarm bell should be going off in your head to convert that to meters right now. Um, also, by the way, 250 grams. Alarm bell should be going off in your head to convert that to kilograms. So if the gunpowder is capable of applying an average force of 3.2 times 10 to the 4th newtons to the bullet over the length of the barrel, you know, that it explodes, the hot gas pushes the bullet out of the barrel of the gun, what velocity is it going to leave the barrel with? So whenever that bullet comes flying out, what velocity, the muzzle velocity, what velocity is it going to have? So let's write down everything we know. We know what delta x is. The bullet is going to be accelerated for 0.79 meters. Check it out. I made sure to convert. Um, let's see here. I also know the initial velocity. The initial velocity before the gunpowder is set off is 0 meters per second. I know the force that's being applied to it. It's 3.2 times 10 to the fourth meters, excuse me, newtons. I also know um, that I'm looking for the final velocity, question mark, and the mass of the bullet is 0 0.250 kilograms. And so maybe we should just try to go straight for the answer. I'm looking for the final velocity. I know the initial and uh, how far it went, and so I look at my equation sheet and I realize I have a problem here. I don't know enough information. Uh, none of my kinematic equations, nor F equals MA, is going to give me what, what I need. But there is an in-between. What if I went ahead and solved for the acceleration and then use that in a kinematic equation? That will work for me. So let's use F equals MA. And since there's only one force, I can drop the sigma sign, meaning sum of here. So F equals MA, 3.2 times 10 to the fourth equals 0.25a, and you divide both sides by 0.25, and you come out with a equal to 1.28 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So my acceleration, 1.28 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. Okay, that's great. I can use that number now in a kinematic equation. So I can bring that over here, 1.28 times 10 to the fifth meters per second, a really big, and that should be meters per second squared, that should be a really big acceleration. It should be a large force. I mean, think about it. It's a bullet in a gun, right? So now I can pick a kinematic equation. I know A. I know uh, displacement, delta X. I know VI, and I'm looking for VF. So an equation that's going to work perfectly for us here is VF squared equals VI squared plus 2A delta X. In all of these, whenever you hit a multi-part problem, right, you're going to go straight for the answer, and then you're going to have to pause and kind of backtrack, look at your equation sheet, and see if you have something. If you don't have something, how can you get something that's going to give you one that you need? So yes, you are going to have to use your equation sheet pretty well here, um, looking at it and trying to figure out what equation fits. And once you've done it a bunch, you'll get the hang, you'll get the hang of it. So VF squared equals 0 squared plus 2 times 1.2810 to the fifth. And sorry, I'm kind of running in over here. Um, and then 0.79 for my delta x. Let me go ahead and let's just solve that around. Remember, I'm going to have to take the square root of both sides. I come out uh, with five, with uh, excuse me, 450 with significant figures meters per second as the muzzle velocity, the final velocity here. Uh, significant figures from up here, 79 centimeters. So I multiplied all this and then took the square root because VF squared.